There are so many things that can be said about Clark Mollenhoff, and I, I, I'll, I'll assure you that most of those are positive. Uh, <laughs> about the only negative things I heard about Clark came from the copy desk of the register, and some of those guys down there occasionally st snarl, you know, and, uh, and growl about his long, legalistic, complex sentences that they have to uh, take apart. But other than that, uh, almost all the professional comments about Clark Mollenhoff are very laudatory. Uh, he's really a very well-known character around these parts. Clark was, is a native of Webster City. He's a graduate of the law school at Drake University. He spent several years as a state house and local government reporter for the Register, and then for, would you believe, 27 years was Washington correspondent first, and then later Washington bureau chief for Cole's publications, which encompassed the Des Moines newspapers, the Minneapolis newspapers, and Look Magazine while it was in existence. Uh, Clark spent a brief abortive career as ombudsman for the Richard Nixon administration. Uh, and he's currently a journalism professor at Washington and Lee uh, University. You may be interested to know that Washington and Lee University was the first college in the United States to offer a journalism program. And the first program was established in Washington and Lee after the Civil War, as you can't hear described for the Army. During the war, they did college crisis around this country. What do you think the elite were going to embarrass the old country by making all these journalism departments for them? Because it was all Robert E. Lee's uh, fault. Uh, Clark has authored eight books about Washington scene, journalism, investigative reporting, uh, labor uh, relations, and uh, organized crime. He was a Neiman Fellow at Harvard University, and he is a recipient of the highest award that a journalist can receive, the Pulitzer Award, which he received in 1958. And he got that for a series of stories which exposed uh, questionable activities by labor unions, and his stories uh, set off some congressional hearings, and eventually they were responsible for shooting Dave Beck out of the saddle as president of the Teamsters Union. Uh, Clark winces a little bit when he thinks about the fact that Dave Beck was replaced by Jimmy Hoffa, who was replaced by Frank Fitzsimmons, you know. And he doesn't take any credit for having cleaned up the Teamsters Union. <laughs> Things haven't improved a hell of a lot, even though he did a good job of, uh, of reporting. Uh, his list of professional awards sounds kind of like a journalistic uh, hall of fame. In addition to the Pulitzer Award, Clark has received awards and fellowships and so forth which have been named in honor of John Peter Zenger, Eliah Lovejoy, William Allen White, Raymond Clapper, Haywood Broom, and Drew Pearson. Have I missed any? I think that's about it. Now that's a pretty fair set of names in, in the, in the uh, history of journalism. Uh, I have one personal observation I'd like to make about Clark, and that is I'm sure that every day and regular readers of the newspapers will allow that Clark is a, is a tough, aggressive, watchdog type reporter. I think the thing that they may not realize is that Clark is a pioneer among his contemporaries in this area of investigative or interpretive or in perspective or depth reporting, whatever you want to call it. The kind of reporting that in recent years has received and has deserved a great deal of prestige. Last spring, uh, three members of the journalism department, including myself, is Tom Emerson and Dale Boyd and myself, as well as the editor of the Ames Tribune, were fortunate enough to attend the Investigative Reporters and Editors Association second annual convention in Columbus, Ohio, at a, on the Ohio State campus. And when we arrived in the hotel there, the first two persons we saw in the lobby were Clark Mollenhoff, and Kurt McDougall joined with each other. You may not know, but uh, Kurt McDougall is a legendary retired uh, journalism professor from Northwestern, who I think in 1936 or 1938 wrote a book 
titled Interpretive Reporting. And what he did, he spelled out the ground rules and the policies and philosophies and so forth behind the kind of reporting that in recent years most people have come to respect. So there was old Kurt McDougall had written a book under investigative reporting, and, and there was Clark Mullenhoff, who had put into practice probably 30 years ago the kind of reporting that McDougall was talking about. And I thought to myself, if I were Kurt and I were Clark and I watched the stars, uh, the star performers who were going to speak at that convention walk through the door, and there were stars, Jack Anderson, syndicated columnist, a fellow by the name of Cy Hirsch, who is a New York Times correspondent who broke the Me Lai story and most of the CIA exposures, and half of the uh, Stardust twins of the Washington Post Watergate coverage, Carl Bernstein, those were the speakers at the IRE convention. And I think if I were Kurt and I were Clark and I watched those guys walk into the lobby ready to make their speeches, I would have said, hey, uh, hey, you turkeys, you know, you finally figured out what this journalism business is all about. Uh, I'd like to make one final comment about Clark, and uh, that is that I'm really personally indebted to him a great deal because he taught to my second quarter reporting, my intermediate reporting course today. And uh, I've taught that course for some time. At the end of the quarter, I always get these course criticisms which say, we resent your profanity, Cooner. If you know, you could make your point, you know, without all of those swear words. And after listening to Mullenhoff, I expect to get a hell of a lot gentler treatment from those <laughs> students at the end of the quarter. That's it, Clark. Thank you so much, Bill. I'm sorry to have offended your students. I, I didn't realize that out here they were so sensitive. Of course, I'd been reading uh, and listening to the White House tapes and all of those expletives deleted, and maybe I was striving to be a presidential caliber. <laughs> uh, it was mentioned here that uh, I was uh, ombudsman for President Nixon. And uh, with all of those awards and so forth, there's one thing I can really claim to be the greatest, really like Ali. I'm the greatest failure of this century. I was supposed to keep the Nixon administration clean. <laughs> uh, and uh, that was a sensational failure. But in that role, it was my job to take the evidence of indications of wrongdoing in government, round up the facts, put them together with the law, and call them to the detention of the president in a way that he would be impelled to act. Now, I think I was a little harsh with myself in saying it was complete failure, only about a half failure. Well, actually only about 20 percent, because most of the time, they did what was suggested, because most of the things that go wrong in government are not partisan political. They are bureaucratic problems. They are frauds that are continuing problems. At the Welfare Department, HEW, in the Defense Department, in essentially every one of the government agencies. They have nothing to do with whether it's Richard Nixon president Jimmy Carter president, Jack Kennedy president. And the fact of the matter is that the presidents of the United States need an ombudsman to keep their own government straight, and Jimmy Carter is demonstrating that today with his total lack of comprehension of what's involved in the Lance case. Now, Jimmy Carter isn't alone. The only thing that wears heavier on Jimmy Carter is the fact that Jimmy Carter is doing this in the aftermath of the Nixon debacle and in the aftermath of Ford's errors. I would think at this stage that he would be well advised to stop and think before he comes to Burt Lance's defense. Now, there's been, there have been a few statements by the President, 
by Jody Powell about the press hounding Lance out of office. There were a couple of stories early on, one column and another couple of stories, that probably went a little beyond the evidence. But since then, Jimmy Carter and Lance have had absolutely nothing to complain about. But keep this in mind. There on the desk, before Jimmy Carter, when he made his decision to go to Lance's defense, was a four-inch report by his appointed controller of the currency. Now, it was a cleverly worded report. Hyman, a Carter appointee, didn't say, Jimmy, your Burt Lance is involved in unethical and illegal contest, conduct. He didn't have to say that. He spelled out in detail more than 50 law violations. He spelled out corroborated facts that spell out unethical conduct in the extreme. This business of using one bit of collateral for two different loans. They put people in jail for that. It's not only unethical, it is illegal. He seized upon one paragraph in that report that said, there is no evidence that would justify prosecution. Well, that's a hell of a lot different than saying he's clean. It just says we haven't quite got it on him. We can't put him in jail. We should have expected better than that of this administration. And the administration in this respect has no complaints at all with the press. And when Jody Powell says that he wasn't complaining about the press, he is again falsifying because he was complaining about the press. When he was down in Des Moines yesterday, he said he wasn't complaining about the press. Who the hell was he saying was hounding? The Republicans in this particular case have been most responsible. Because, I don't know if it's because they're so kind-hearted to Democrats. This is a situation where it was so damn bad that the Democrats knew how bad it was, and they've been trying to tell Carter for the last two weeks, get off your tail. Get them out of there. Now, I think it's particularly good that the press has been so sound on this particular thing. It's been low key, because they have been low key, because it comes on the heels of the Watergate matter, where the press, while on the long haul, was accurate, and Richard Nixon got everything he deserved. In fact, there were some abuses of the power of the press, some misstatements along the way, some of the initial reporting and some of the reporting by the Post was overly aggressive and was not factually accurate. In the overall, Nixon deserved it. So you can't make any big point of it. But there's no question in my mind that Richard Nixon came down in part because he was a conservative Republican because he was so easy to dislike. <laughs> he just was not a lovable character. <laughs> and when uh, Vic Lasky did this book, which has just come out recently, that it didn't start with Watergate, the basic theme on it's right. All the abuses of power that Richard Nixon engaged in, our presidents before that had been engaging in. Now, where Vic Lasky goes wrong is in saying that because they did it, Richard Nixon was innocent. It doesn't follow. Richard Nixon was guilty, and so were the other bastards. <laughs> and they should have had some kind of punishment and investigation that fit the crime. Now, the fact that this went on for this long period of time, these abuses of power, was something I was aware of. I was writing about it. You go back through the papers. I wrote about it, the abuses of power and executive privilege, when 
Eisenhower was doing it. When Kennedy was doing it, I broke up a lovely friendship with, Rick, with uh, John Kennedy and Bobby Kennedy because I wanted to call it the same damn way with them that I was calling it in other administrations. I called it the same way under the Johnson administration. And Richard Nixon's use of executive privilege to cover up his crimes only represented an extension of the things that had been taking place before. Now, he did it in a grand manner, <laughs> and he did it in a stupid manner. The Congress of the United States didn't want to impeach him. They really didn't want to investigate him because they were afraid they'd get investigated too. Now, they all had plenty to hide, as we're seeing. But he taunted them. He arrogantly used his power and refused to cough up, continue to tell lies to the American people, and they didn't have any choice. Carter is now in the process of duplicating this. And if he doesn't watch out, he could be in the same deep trouble. Because when Nixon went through that impeachment process, halfway through it, we didn't know how the country would stand it. Now we tried it once. We know we can get rid of a president and not have a tremor. The country goes right along. Carter better not tempt him. And he's in a situation where in this week, he's going to have a precarious situation because the stories that Bert Lance has been telling to the press are false stories. If he tells those same stories under oath when he goes before that committee on Thursday, he can be prosecuted for perjury. In fact, there are indications, and this depends upon the prosecutor, because these are all judgment calls. If somebody wanted to put him in jail now or indict him for perjury, the case is made. He said that all of these loans were collateralized. The fact is they weren't. He'd used the same collateral on two loans. You know, they put you in the jail for that. The mistake Carter made on August 18th was that he thought the American people were mesmerized by his pipeline to God. <laughs> and so that they would accept him. And, and you know, this is something that happens to all these presidents. I haven't seen one that hasn't happened. When they get in there, they're kind of going to be another just average guy down the street. I guess the only fellow who really did this was Harry Truman. And he was so much the average guy, he really couldn't avoid it. Uh, <laughs> but they get over there, and the first week, they're, they're pretty sane people. And then they get so much bowing and scraping and awed silence. Oh, the president's said, Or the president's here. You see those secretaries in the executive office building. Oh, the president's outside. You get a little bit of that treatment, it can just jar hell out of even a sane person. And most of our presidents are a little wacky. Anybody who wants to be president of the United States is a little wacky. <laughs> the thing I'm here to speak about, though, is the business of the press, a vital institution but vulnerable. And I've talked about the, the slight points of vulnerability with regard to the way they performed on Nixon. Not important now because that's behind us. All we should do is know that there were vulnerable points. They are doing a good job on Carter. But there are some developments in the press that concern me a great deal. And one of these uh, was involved in a, uh, was part of a Washington Post series that was produced recently in which there was a survey indicating that within the next two decades, all of the daily newspapers in this country will be owned by, 12, by less than 12 major conglomerates. Now, conceded that many of those chains, those major conglomerates, produce better papers than some of the independent papers that were purchased concede that many of them are real fine newspaper organizations like Dow Jones and Knight Ritter. Still, you have less voices. And it is not the wisdom 
It is not the honesty. It is not the integrity of the American press that's important in that First Amendment. It's the diversity of views. Because no one and no small group has that great wisdom and honesty to be able to tell you what you should think. The American press should make hundreds of voices available. And then some way you might, through observing all of it and listening to all of it, come to the conclusion of what was, what is the truth. Now, this lack of diversity is really the main problem. But why is it a problem? Well, number one, the White House will find it much easier to influence and control 12 organizations than it can the hundreds of, of daily papers that exist today. And we've seen something of what can happen when we have the three networks. While the networks do excellent jobs in some areas, we all know how superficial most of the news treatment is on the general news program. We may <coughs> say a word of commendation on 60 Minutes most of the time, which represents a fine effort to do depth reporting in a nonpartisan, non-ideological manner. Now, once in a while, they slip on something. They might slip next week. So don't hold me on that one. Uh, you're never any better than what you have before you. And anything I'm vouching for on any of these organizations is as of today. ABC has Brett Hume, who is an excellent reporter, who was an aide to Jack Anderson, and that is not necessarily why I say he's an excellent reporter. Uh, he was the guts of the reporting by Anderson's column on the ITT matter. When that came up for challenge in the Senate Judiciary Committee, it was Britt Hume who made me proud that I was a newspaper man because he had done everything that a newspaper man, a responsible newspaper man, should do in checking out the stories on Kleindienst and what he had done relative to IT&T matters. Jack Anderson went before the committee, and he made me just blush just a little bit because he was all showboat and not much fact. And it happened to be Jack Anderson's column, but it was Brett Hume who was the strength of that particular presentation. Anderson is more noted for the Eagleton affair. And it's, again, one of those things that, that, that I'm constantly apologizing for. When, when someone asks me about it, I always say, well, you know, Jack's better than that most of the time. And I'm not really sure of that all the time. That may be just a little fudge. But <laughs> Jack has done a lot of very good work. His column has done a lot of good work. But he's made just enough big boo-boos that he represents a burden for the investigative reporters of this country. <coughs> Speaking about Brett Hume with ABC, and they have Sandy Van Oker, who they have hired recently to head their investigative team. I don't know how Sandy's going to work out. He has the basic ability. I don't know whether he will be able to uh, control his ideological hang-ups and so forth to push it through. Uh, NBC has Jim Polk, who incidentally is a uh, young man who graduated from, Web, from uh, Mason City High School. I got Webster City on the brain. I should have. I came out of that high school. Mason City High School is where, where Jim Polk went to school. He was, got a Pulitzer Prize for an aspect of the Watergate affair when he was a reporter for the Washington Star. And he is now chief investigative reporter for NBC. And he does an absolutely excellent job uh, all of the time and if you had that kind of reporting from the networks all the time, I'd be completely satisfied with it. Unfortunately, you don't have it. And part of this is because of the format they have. They have a format where they have to touch dozens of stories in a half-hour period of time. And they can give no more 
than one or two minutes or three minutes, maybe to the big story. That amounts to about 500 words. There is no way in the world that you can give a balanced account of a complicated subject in 500 words. But our networks are contaminated by the need of the Washington bureau chiefs to handle everything in the entertainment field across Washington, too. So even at the time when the networks and their, Wash their White House correspondents disliked Richard Nixon intently, they were compromising themselves because the bureau chiefs wanted to get some entertainment froth, you know, like 30 minutes with Pat or an evening with Trish or uh, a day with Julie. Now, that's fine. There's some people that like that. I think that comic sections have a place in newspapers. <laughs> I don't think it's important. I think the sports are a, an important part of newspapers and an important part of, of uh, television. And despite anything that anyone might say about Iowa, Iowa State, I think it is not protected by the First Amendment. The First Amendment is supposed to deal with government operations. And we are supposed to patrol that area. And any time there are factors that become involved where we cannot be totally and thoroughly independent, we're losing ground. Now, we have the networks and their kind of spotty performance before us today. We know that the White House uses subtle and not so subtle efforts to influence the Washington press corps. They use entertainment at the White House for publishers and editors. And you'd be amazed how many so-called independent publishers and editors give their right arm for a chance to go over, and they wouldn't care whether it's Dick or Jimmy or Jerry or Jack, just to go to the White House, you know, to go to the White House and just have a few words with the President of the United States. Some of these publishers, they're, they're really naive. Come back and their folks in the business community say, well, Dick was telling me the other night at the White House. That's <laughs> worth a hell of a lot. That's real one-upsmanship. And sometimes they sell their soul. And, you know, uh, this is the area where you can work like hell on a story and try to convince the editor that it, that it should go and try to convince the publisher it's important and they'll be just lukewarm as hell. But they hear some little cocktail gossip from somebody who's really on the end, who's in the, with the White House, and he doesn't even have to document it. He just whispers. They put you on it right away, and you spend about a week running down whether it's true or not. You usually have to come in and say, there isn't anything true to that, boss. That's the reality, just like in what you're seeing in Washington behind closed doors. That is, how many of you have seen that? That is an accurate portrayal of what takes place in the White House. I know. I was in there with all the throat cutting and, and uh, knife stabbing in the back when Haldeman was there. And the Haldeman character, well, they're actually very nice to Haldeman. <laughs> He's much worse than that. Now, the Klein character, that was the communications director who Holland was trying to get rid of. Herb Klein was, was a nice guy and a very responsible person. But he wasn't quite so nicey nice. And Jeb Magruder, who were there moving in behind him, was a fairly good representation, but he's a little nicer than that. Uh, he wasn't, he was willing to undercut his boss. He was willing to lie, to cheat, to steal, which isn't very nice. But he's portrayed as, as just a little bit too nasty a character, because I think that Jeb, like Chapin, like a good many of the others who were over there in that period of time, had the potential 
for being good public officials. Gardner Coles and John Coles went to the White House in the 1950s at a time when I was pursuing President Eisenhower rather diligently on the Dixon Yates case, the Latajinsky case, and the Sherman Adams case. And uh, they were over there for these nice little cocktail parties and little uh, stag parties. And uh, I couldn't understand why General Coles couldn't keep a private long enough in line. And while I was kept the fellow like Daniel Washington did, where I kept asking all these pesky questions and questions, um, that was on the side of the coals in this area. I heard nothing from them about that. They didn't mention a word to me, and I found out about it later through Fletcher Knabel and through George Mills. That was great work by, a pub by publishers. Again, in Lyndon Johnson administration, I was pursuing Bobby Baker and Lyndon Johnson rather avidly, and uh, I thought they were crooks, and that they, they were, should not be in public office. And, uh, during that period of time, Fletcher Knabel was president of the Gridiron Club. As president of the Gridiron Club, he sat at the head table. That was next to the president of the United States, Lyndon Johnson. And Gardner Mike Co and John Coles were also seated at the head table, one on one side of Knabel and one on the other side of Mr. Johnson. That Gridiron dinner went through, and I never heard anything about any conversations, but about a week or two later, Fletcher Knabel came to me and he says, you know, you'd have been proud of your bosses the other night. Lyndon Johnson spent the whole damn dinner trying to get him to fire you and he didn't give him a tumble. <laughs> it's kind of nice to have that kind of an assurance every once in a while. <laughs> now, I, I've had that little problem ever since uh, I was covering a Polk County courthouse <laughs> back in the 1940s. There was only one thing that the Polk County Board of Supervisors were kind of unanimous on. And they wrote a nice letter to the editor on it. That was they wanted Mollenhoff fired. Well, we had a very good editor, and a very courageous editor, and a very fair person, and he did not fire me. <laughs> and over a period of the next few months, we had four of that mem members of that Board of Supervisors indicted, and we had about three of them convicted. We got the sheriff and a couple of his deputies indicted and convicted, and uh, miscellaneous others. Now, uh, we were factually active. We weren't smearing under any circumstances. We stayed within the facts, and that is the way I think that journalism should be practiced, whether it's in Polk County or in Washington, D.C. One of the things that makes you straight across the board on this in Polk County or covering Des Moines City Hall is you have to go down there that next day covering that beat and look that guy in the eye where you wrote a bad story about him. And when you do that, you have to be in a position that you know you told it truthfully and you didn't take any advantage of it. And that's good practice. In Washington, you can get by with a little sharpshooting where you take a shot at somebody, a cheap shot, on a little evidence, and you don't see him anymore. You just run off and hide. And there's a lot of that takes place. Now, these people who try to influence editors and publishers are not limited to presidents. Vice presidents, senators, congressmen, and as I mentioned, supervisors, all try to influence your editors and publishers to either get you fired or to call you off from time to time. And I say, fortunately, I have not been called off and have not been suppressed in that way. I know others who have. I know others, and seeing those others and the subtle pressures that are used has convinced me that any time you cut down the number of voices that are being heard, you've done a disservice to the concept of the free press. Now, the free press is, from time to time, irresponsible, corrupt, but 
when you analyze the First Amendment, you have to see that's not a right for the free press when it's responsible. That's not a right for the free press when it's honest. That's a right of the free press to be wrong. Because if it's otherwise, somebody in government is making the decision when it's responsible and when it's irresponsible. And that sets the stage for dictatorships. The only restraint there should be upon the press is the right of any citizen to bring suit for libel if he is personally damaged. I'm concerned in this respect that the Supreme Court, in some of its decisions, has gone probably a little too far in, with public officials. Most public officials today are pretty much free game. And unfortunately, too many people in the press are taking advantage of that. Now, uh, over a period of years, I've developed a, a few rules that, that I think are for sound reporting and that will bar irresponsible reporting. I think that there can never be too much sound investigative reporting. When you see that budget, federal budget, going up to $400 billion, when I went to Washington, it was $50 billion. And there can be a hell of a lot more wrong in $400 billion than $50 billion. It's just a difference, and it's more complicated. You have more programs. You can't have too little irresponsible reporting, and we always have too much in this field. Now, I have seven rules that I've developed, and I just codified them here in the last year in connection with my teaching down at Washington Lee University. Um, I dealt with them over a period of about 20 years in a general way in seminars at the American Press Institute at Columbia University, and I say I got it simplified down here. But number one is avoid partisanship. And when you're talking to the press, this is, this is really not only fair, but it's just common sense, because think of it. Half of the crooks are probably Republicans, and half are Democrats. If you cut yourself out, if you're going to be partisan, you're only going to be shooting half of them. <laughs> and if you get caught and labeled as just a guy who investigates democratic corruption, it'll hurt your cred credibility. Likewise, if you only investigate Republican corruption. Uh, <laughs> there are about as many Republicans who are crooks as there are Democrats, and, and I might say that there are quite a few bipartisan crooks <laughs> who manage to get a hand in the tail regardless who's president. <laughs> and, and this, you got to really, really be free to swing on them, too. And rule two is, in seeking facts and answers, whenever you're involved in this investigation, you have to make a conscientious and determined effort to be equally aggressive whether the public official involved is someone you admire or you dislike. And again, it's a matter of just common sense. You will do your friend a favor by asking him a tough, direct question, because you will be demonstrating that he will be held accountable. It will prod him to be a better public official than he would be otherwise. Now, but the same token, it is wise to give those you dislike or distrust the benefit of the doubt, as you start on your investigation at least. This is your protection against jumping to an unwarranted conclusion that can undermine the soundness of your whole investigation. Because once you charge something that's not warranted, you can spend all the rest of the damn time defending when you might be right on the basic issue. Remind yourself constantly that if the case against the public official is really there, that it will eventually emerge. And that if there are any falsehoods or deceptions in his presentation, that they will weigh doubly against him when the facts are all in. Richard Nixon. Richard Nixon's lies were what caught up with him. 
He wasn't involved in the Watergate burglary. He just arrogantly used his power and misused his power and lied to the American people about what was involved. And that became the substantive crime, which was a, a cover-up. Leaning overboard is really never harmful to an investigation. If you're going to try, try to be fair and lean overboard, okay, it protects you against libel, and it makes you more credible. And above all, common decency and fair play are as basic as due process of law. This is particularly important in those areas of the country or in those localities where there is only one newspaper or where there are two or more, more newspapers under one control. It's most important that where you do have a monopoly situation that you bend over backwards to be fair. Rule three is know your subject, whether it's a problem of city, county, or state, federal government, or whether it involves big labor or big business. These can be complicated subjects, but they're within the grasp of anyone of average intelligence. In preparing for an important interview, do your homework on the facts and the law and on the individual involved in your study. Don't just parrot a few questions put to you by the opposition without really knowing what your questions are all about, because that can get you in trouble. And frequently, if it's a complicated subject matter, if you haven't done your homework, the fellow you're questioning may admit a law violation, and you won't even know it. The rule of knowing your subject can't be overemphasized. If you're in a highly technical area, as I mentioned, you're dealing with a complicated fact situation, you may make an unintentional mistake simply because you didn't understand what the fellow was telling you. And again, the poorly informed or half-informed reporter is a sitting duck for a snow job. Rule four, don't exaggerate or distort the facts of the law under any circumstance. Lord, there's enough wrong in our society. You don't have to make anything up. This is particularly true of the operations of any federal agency. Believe me. If you do a proper job of investigating and follow through on virtually any agency, the truth's going to be more shocking than anything you could conceivably make up. Watergate and the investigations that followed, dealing with the CIA and the FBI, should have driven this point home so it would not be forgotten. And one should remember all the time, when you sensationalize, you discredit your own investigation. The cold, hard facts, unembellished by a lot of fancy rhetoric, is really stronger than any of the adjectives that you may toss into it. When in doubt, leave it out. If you've got three cases, three points against a fella that are solid, don't throw that other thing in because that's what he'll deny. If he can deny it, and you'll get in a debate with him on that one point, and the public will forget that you're right on three. Rule five, Deal straight across the board with your sources and investigative subjects alike. In this area, you ask straightforward questions that go to the heart of the problem. You don't be sneaky and ask some question that just to get a point in that'll take him off guard. If it's important, if it's really relevant, go right to the heart of it. If you give someone your word on a confidence, keep that word even if it means personal jeopardy, including going to jail. Above all, don't go around blabbing to your press colleagues about who your confidential sources are. And I hear an awful lot of this at the press club bar. They're going to say, confidential, my source, my confidential source is this. But if some law enforcement officer, somebody else wants to know, they won't tell them. But everybody else knows about it. That's damn foolishness. If you deal straight with your subjects of your investigation, it's quite likely that they will be your best sources on inside information at some subsequent stage. On this, I have a very interesting case involving 
the Teamsters Union up in Minneapolis. There was a fellow named Sidney Brennan who was the vice president up there, and I was really hot on his tail. Finally got him in jail. I played square with him. There wasn't a place where he could say foul. So when he went to jail, he calls me to tell me about all the other scoundrels. Because, <laughs> because he knew he was wrong and should be going to jail, and he resented the fact that they were staying out. Well, uh, it often happens that way, and that's only the, the clearest case in this area. Rule six, do not violate the law unless you're prepared to take the consequences. Now, I could have said don't violate the law because I have never found it necessary to violate the law to get a story. But there are some circumstances where some reporters and some papers have violated the law where they and their own judgment felt that a violation of the law was justified. Now, that's all right if they want to pay the penalty. But be prepared to go to jail because there isn't any shield law that protects you and we shouldn't have a shield law. If you give sufficient study to any problem in depth, you can usually find out a way to get the information. And it's not so important all the time to get it for tomorrow morning's edition. That's not a good reason for violating the law. That's about the kind of logic that Richard Nixon used, because he's president. Uh, because I got a deadline in two hours, I can burglarize because it takes me too long to get the answer otherwise. That's Richard Nixon logic. If you do not know basic tools of evidence, you're a damn fool in this business. Information is our business. And I don't think there are very many reporters would have much regard for a lawyer who didn't know basic evidence. And I don't think they'd have much regard for a doctor who didn't know basic anatomy. And yet there are a hell of a lot of reporters running around this world who don't know basic information policy, which should be their business. That should be the minimum. Now, rule seven is use direct evidence when writing a story that reflects adversely upon anyone and give that person an opportunity for a full response to the specific question of impropriety that's raised. Direct testimony is often unreliable when the witness has no person, even when a witness has no personal interest and the chance for error increases geometrically as he is removed one, two, or three steps from that source. These are the rules of basic hearsay. You don't introduce hearsay evidence except under unusual circumstances, and you never can get second or third hand hearsay admitted in a court case. Do not use hearsay, double hearsay or triple hearsay, evidence to reflect adversely upon anyone. Sometimes, if it doesn't reflect adversely on someone, you can take some hearsay from somebody. But if it accuses somebody of a crime, don't use it. Now, and above all, don't use it just because Woodward and Bernstein got by with it in the final days. If you, if you recall, the final days, which 80% of that book, or probably more, was pretty well documented but they cluttered the damn thing up with a lot of hearsay things. For examples on Richard Nixon's sex life. Now, I don't think that uh, Woodward and Bernstein had any inside pipeline to Richard Nixon's bedroom. Because they weren't even around that long. Because they purported to say that sex had not entered the Pat-Richard relationship from some time in the fall of 1964. Well, those were years when Woodward was probably back in grade school. And uh, whatever pipeline he had later, uh, that didn't take care of it. At a later stage, they contended that their information came from someone who had talked to someone who had talked to Pat's doctor. Well, that's real good. Uh, just, just examine that whole situation. They purported to say that it was an actual fact 
that Pat hadn't slept with Richard from some time in the fall of 1962 when he lost the governorship in California. They all related to that in some kind of mental quirks that he had. And in the same token, they hinted darkly at some kind of an interesting relationship between Richard Nixon and Bibi Rebozo, where he's supposed to have gotten his kicks there. Uh, <laughs> now, the fact of the matter is, he didn't have any evidence of that. There hasn't been any evidence produced today. I don't know whether there's anything to it. I don't know whether something will emerge. But they didn't have it, and they shouldn't have said it. It cluttered up the damn book. And here was a book that was solid. Richard Nixon is a crook. They had that. Why make him a homosexual crook? <laughs> Unless it's just for kids. Why make him, why prove that his wife was, or try to prove that his wife was, went on a drinking binge on the evidence of second and her, and third-hand hearsay that she was going around the kitchen with a glass with something in it that looked like bourbon. This is damn small evidence, even if it were true. What is the point? And it destroys the rest of the story. And, and that praying scene with Kissinger. Their version now obviously came from Kissinger. Well, they know that Kessinger's a liar. Everybody knows Kessinger's a liar. So why would you believe? And they made this point in the book. Well, why do you believe a liar on a second or third hand version where you know Kissinger, whatever he told to his staff members when he went out of there, was to make Kissinger a big man? It's Kissinger saying, God, you'd never guess what Richard Nixon did today. We had this big praying scene, and you know that it would be Kissinger making Kissinger look like the great man and Richard Nixon looking like the craven creep that he was. <laughs> but it's Kissinger's version. And by the time Kissinger's version gets told to somebody else on his staff and gets told to somebody else, well, you know, in an accident, you get five witnesses. All of them will tell you different stories on little details if they all saw it. And take that and apply it to the Kissinger situation. I wouldn't use that kind of a story and the only reason they used that kind of a story was to sensationalize the book. Now, it sold a lot of books. I'm sure that those little incidents that I've just referred to here, they were the talk of the town, they were the talk of the nation, and they damn well should have been. But not from a standpoint of being fact, just the shocking fact that Woodward and Bernstein, after doing a good book, cluttered up this book with that kind of trash. And they presented, if they had presented those things, they could have dealt with those same things in the perspective that some people around Kissinger gave this version, or some of the people around the White House gave this version of Pat. But they didn't even do that. They purported to, to be a fly on the wall who saw all this thing take place, and they selected out the facts that they would believe. Well, it doesn't take much garbage on a banquet table to make it stink. And in this case, they threw some garbage on their banquet table, and it stunk. And unfortunately, a lot of the public was misled by this. Now, I wasn't misled for the simple reason that I'd read all of the Watergate material, knew what all the witnesses had testified, had gone through all of the documents. So as I would go through, I could say, well, yes, that's testified to, that's supported, but this isn't. But you, the public, were misled because you treated the whole thing as if it were equally documented. Now, nothing I've said here tonight is intended to make anybody less aggressive as an investigative reporter. It's simply intended to make the more responsible. Because whenever you overstate in any of these cases, it finally catches up with you. And uh, I, I have been distressed with uh, some things in the press and the fact that some of these people seem to have success. And, and to think the same thing is true about society as a whole. Uh, there's a book by Robert Ringer, Looking Out for Number One. 
You've seen it advertised. It's a totally cynical book that pushes the thesis that don't look out for your neighbor, don't be concerned with anything else, be, don't be concerned with honesty and truth. This is all a bunch of crap for the naive. Well, I've been following these cases, and all of the cases that I've been following over the last 35 years demonstrate to me that anybody is a damn fool who is dishonest, because it always catches up with them, regardless of their power. Jimmy Hoffa had more power than the President of the United States, so did Dave Beck, and it caught up with them. Richard Nixon went down in flames. Old Lyndon Johnson got by with it. Good old Lyndon. Uh, he got his $20 million fortune, but he'd probably given up half of it for a good name because he knew everybody in the Congress, knew he was a crook, even when he went to his death. As you practice journalism, keep in mind, don't do anything dishonest, don't do anything unethical, it's stupid. Don't cut a corner, because if you do, and anybody knows about it, they got a club over you. If I'd operated in the White House under Richard Nixon and had given anybody over there a club over me, I'd have felt that club when I started to question Richard at those press conferences or even some time before that. Play it straight. And uh, if you play it straight, it won't make any difference what publication you work for, you'll end up ahead. Because as young journalists, you can learn a lot even through some sad experiences. Even if you work for a publisher or an editor, who isn't all that he should be. You play it straight, because if you do something for him that's dishonest, you're not any better than Jeb Magruder or John Dean. And I know some journalists who aren't any better, John Dean or Jeb Magruder or Bob Haldeman. And it usually catches up with them, and uh, if it doesn't, until the end, they still have to live with their conscience. Well, now I've been talking here kind of a monologue for a long period of time. And as I said to some of the classes this afternoon, uh, when I'm talking, I'm, I'm no, I'm interested. Because I really don't know what I'm going to say next. <laughs> but if I open up for questioning, then I know I've got at least one or two people out there who are really kind of interested in what I might have to say. And so let's have some questions here. Yes. Uh, she asked about a Bernstein article in Rolling Stones. Uh, I haven't read the article in Rolling Stones. What was the concept of the article? Well, I don't think that there were three or four hundred reporters who were CIA, CIA operatives, and but I do know that there were a large number of reporters who, for a long period of time, with the knowledge of their publishers and editors, were making some reports to CIA. I, I probably I could if I wanted to name you a half a dozen or a dozen who were, who were quite prominent. Now, uh, during a period of time, I don't think that's right. I don't think that they should be operatives for the CIA. Uh, I, think, I don't think that they should ever be in a position where they're receiving money. Now, I have never had any kind of an arrangement like that with the FBI, with other law enforcement officers, if they ask me a question about something that I've been dealing with and they've been writing about, and I can supply them an answer without violating any confidential relationship, I try to supply them with an accurate answer. But uh, I never engage in, in a buddy-buddy relationship with them or telling things uh, from confidential sources. And I think these are, these are, these are fine lines that, that have to be adhered to. But some, I've heard, uh, some were on, uh, some well-known columnists were on the payroll of the CIA, and some of them traveled abroad, and th this was, in, in fact, a, a kind of a propaganda operation. You had a hard time telling them when they were doing what 
they should be doing and when they were putting out CIA propaganda. I, I think that overall the, the investigations of the CIA have been good for the country. I had some, some little qualms about this when uh, Cy Hirsch did those first stories because I really didn't uh, believe we always have to be concerned about national security and we have to be concerned about the need for this type of an intelligence operation when the other side is using it. However, as time went on and as the cases were documented showing the clear-cut abuse of power by the CIA under cover of its intelligence operation, I became convinced that it was helpful to clear the air. I hope that the CIA can restore itself. I have no doubt that in time they will. The same thing is true of the FBI. Uh, a great organization destroyed itself by abusing its power. It needed to be exposed and have those uh, operations cleansed of, of those bad aspects. But we need law enforcement officers, as long we need an international intelligence operation, as long as the Soviet Union represents a, a threat to us in any respect. And they certainly use this type of operation, and they have no ethical standards. We should not bow to their standards. But with the same token, we do need these operations. 